What's up guys, it's Sean here from The Computer Scientist. Today we'll be enhancing the training efficiency of our DQN agent from last video with a technique called Double Deep Q Networks. But before I show you how it works, I'll first describe some of the issues with the original DQN model that this technique aims to solve. Let's go back to the Bellman equation for calculating the current state and action pairs Q value from the next reward and the discount rate gamma times the Q value of the best action to take in the next state. So Q is our function that we are incrementally learning as we interact with the environment. But notice that we are using our evolving model to calculate the update value for itself. The problem here is that our function essentially depends on itself. So whenever we update the parameters of our model for the current state, this could also impact the Q values from the next state, which would then change the target value for the same next state. You could think of this like trying to play hide and seek with someone who's always changing their hiding spot every time you move. That would probably take you a while to find them. So to address this problem, we introduce an intermediary technique called fixed Q targets. This is where we now have two copies of the same Q network, one local network, which we train each time step, and one target network whose parameters we update every few episodes to be the latest parameters of the local network. So now this would be like playing hide and seek with someone who stays in their hiding spot for some time before moving again, which would give you a better chance of finding them. Okay, so now let's see how we can incorporate a second Q network in our current architecture. So this is the network architecture of the original DQN model which I went through in my last video. And I'll just move these a bit so we can focus just on the Q values. Now here we just have the output of the local network, which is a function of the input state, which it transforms with the dense layers to output a vector of Q values for each action. And we want our target network to have the same architecture of function parameters that are the weights and the biases in these dense layers. So we create another branch from the state input with the exact same layers leading to the Q values. Also, just to clarify that this target here is the single Q target value calculated from the Bellman equation. So the local network would still be the one used for calculating the loss for updating the local network's parameters through gradient descent. However, for updating our target network's parameters, we don't do this through backpropagation from a loss function, but instead through a soft copy operation from the local network's parameters. This involves manually assigning the new value of each target network parameter as the weighted sum of the local network's value and the old target value, where the proportion of the local network's value is a hyperparameter called tau. And we can rewrite this as simply adding the distance from the target parameter to the local parameter value, scaled by the upgrade rate tau. Now that we have our new architecture for fixed Q targets, let's code that part up. So I'm back in my Jupyter Notebook from last video where we implemented the basic DQN algorithm. Now to implement fixed Q targets, we need to create our target network with the same layers of our local network, but with separate weights and biases in the dense layers. For this, we will move our dense layers to a function outputting the final Q state layer with action size units, which we need to pass in. We can then call this function to create separate network branches for our local Q state and target Q state. We then update the QStateAction variable for the loss to use the local network's QState vector. But now we need a way to update the target network parameters with the weighted sum of the target and local network's parameters. In order to do this, we need to separate the variables of each network into two groups, which TensorFlow allows us to do through a variable scope. This essentially allows us to specify a string as the scope name, which is added to the front of the name of each variable created within the width block. So then our local network will be in the scope local and likewise for the target network. But whenever we start affecting the names of variables in TensorFlow, it's a good idea to reset the default graph before defining a new network architecture. Okay, so now we can access each network's separate weights and bias variables through TensorFlow's tf.getCollection function, where we specify a key to just get the trainable variables and then the scope that the variables were created in. Now we need to define our update operation for each variable in the target network with its corresponding local network variable. And TensorFlow has a function tf.assign which lets us create an operation to assign a new value to a variable when that operation is run in a session. So then we want to set our new value as the old value plus the difference from the old value to the local value scaled by the update rate tab. Turn this list of operations into a single operation using the TensorFlow tf.group function and then run that in a list alongside our optimizer operation each time we train the model. So now that we have two networks outputting the Q state vector, we need to provide a way of choosing which network's output we want when we call the getQState function. 
So we can just add a parameter use target, which is a boolean defaulted to false, and then set our output queue state layer as the target's output if use target is true, otherwise just use the original local network. And finally, we just need to adjust our agent's queue target calculation to use the target network for getting the queue values for the next state. So now that we've implemented our fixed queue targets, there's still one more step to implementing the full double DQN technique. This step aims to address another issue with the original DQNs, which is the overestimation of queue values. Going back to our Bellman equation, we are calculating the current state action pair's Q value by adding the maximum of the next state's Q values to the reward. But at the start, our Q network is randomly initialized, which would make the calculated Q values for the next state completely inaccurate. So then, if we choose the maximum Q value for the next state, then this would most likely overestimate its true Q value. So the main idea of introducing double Q networks is to avoid selecting the maximum Q value too early which we achieve by having one network select the action for the next state, and the other network to provide the queue value for that action. This way, both networks have to agree on the selected action leading to the maximum queue value. But since we already have a local and a target network from the fixed queue target solution, we can apply these to implement double queue networks as well. So then we just have the question of which network do we use to select the actions, and which network will evaluate the queue value for that action in the next state. So, we can actually just use the local network for selecting actions since it's already used to select actions to take in the current state of the environment, and then we can use the target for retrieving the queue values since its values are kept steady as fixed queue targets. This was the suggested approach in the official double DQN research paper by Haru van Hassel, which I'll link in the description for reference. So now to update our code to match this. So to implement double DQNs from fixed queue targets, we first separate this max calculation into its equivalent action selection and evaluation steps. We first get our next actions as the argmax of the queue values of the next state from the local network where use target is false, and this argmax is over the columns axis. Then we can get the list of individual queue values for each next action in the corresponding next state by indexing each next state's queue value by its corresponding next action and this will replace the max of the queue values in the queue targets calculation. And with that, our agent becomes a double DQN agent, so I'll just rename that here. Now let's run this to see how our double DQN implementation works, and when we do we see that it now manages to consistently reach 200 reward after about 150 episodes. So we managed to train our network slightly faster than before, but how do we really know that this is making a difference? Let's take it a step further and do a few trial runs to see if we can find any visual trends. So what we're going to do is graph the total rewards over each episode for a number of test runs of our agent, using the original DQN and some using the improved double DQN. So we'll first modify the agent's train function to let us specify whether we want to use double DQN or not, through a parameter use ddqn, which we default to true. Then when we're calculating our queue targets, double dqns only uses the target network for evaluating the queue values for the next actions in the next states. So by setting use targets to use ddqn, we can turn our double dqn feature on or off. Then in our training loop, we want to run this for multiple trials, so we'll define a variable for the number of runs being 10 for this experiment. We then create a loop for each run, printing the current run number and initializing a list for the total rewards from each episode. Now since each new agent instance creates a TensorFlow session, we need to make sure that session is closed before creating a new agent. So I'll first assign the agent to none, which will delete the old agent, and then we can create the new agent instance. Then after each episode, we save the total rewards to the list, and after each run, we add that list of total rewards to a list of rewards for each run. Then we can alternate which runs will use a double DQN over a basic DQN, so let's use the double DQN for each even number run where n mod 2 equals 0. Now I'm actually going to run this experiment online in Google Colab to save my CPU power. So I'll download this notebook, search up Google Colab and click on this link. Then go to upload and select the downloaded file. Now if your version of TensorFlow is different from mine, you can install the version I'm using by typing in exclamation mark and then the command to install TensorFlow with equals equals 1.9 to specify the version. So then let's run these cells to start the experiment and this will take a few minutes so I'll fast forward. Okay so now that we have our test run rewards, in order to visualize this, 
who use matplotlib's pyplot and then loop through each run's list of episode rewards, where we first save the x-axis data as the episode numbers. Then we want to plot the average rewards for each episode of the last 100 episodes, so we will create a list of the cumulative total rewards at each episode, which we can get from numpy's comsum function. Then for the first 100 episodes, we just take the average reward, but then after that, we subtract the accumulation from 100 episodes back to get the sum of the rewards over the last 100 episodes, which we just average out. And then we can plot this against the episode numbers. And then we'll use the color red to distinguish the runs which use ddqn, and we'll use blue for dqn, and we'll also specify a label for the legend. So finally, after running the cell, we can see the difference in performance between ddqns and dqns, and it seems that double dbq networks allow for a faster increase in the total reward over fewer episodes. Well, you just learned how to extend the original DQN algorithm to use double DQNs for faster training. And in the next video, I'll introduce you to another training enhancement called Prioritized Experience Replay. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you found it helpful, be sure to give it a like. And until next time, keep learning like a machine. Bye!